Welcome to another edition of Wildcat Country. Eric Cohen and Shane Dale on what's an exciting week for Arizona baseball as they are hosting a regional. I don't think anybody was going to predict that a few months ago. Don't don't lie. You didn't predict it either. No, I'm not saying you, Shane. No, no else, you're right. Nobody out there that would have predicted that. Um, I, you know, that was a, a heck of a game that we saw in Scottsdale uh, this weekend. And uh, it's unfortunate that neither of us could have been there. Yeah, I'm kick, kicking myself about things I, I'm UVA events I'm missing, but, but uh, no, I, well, I was feeling pretty good about the decision in the seventh inning. It was the uh, Arizona was getting no hit, and then they come back and win the whole thing, and uh, a heck of a way for the Pac-12 to go out. Um, you know, the last very last ever Pac-12 game, the last game on Pac-12 Network was an Arizona Wildcats victory, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, excited to see what they're going to do, and uh, plenty of other stuff to talk about as well as always. Yeah, Wildcat Country, once again, brought to you by Harris Ak Chin Casino. And we also will tell you about our, our secondary sponsor, Ice Shaker, in, in a bit. But uh, we're going to change it up a little bit to start. Uh, we had the legendary Bill Walton on this program on January 11th, 2023. It was an absolute thrill for Shane mm -hmm. and myself. I mean, beyond, uh, beyond comprehension. And unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, at the age of 71 on Monday, you know, on Memorial Day. You know, what was interesting is that we had a guest on in the last few months. And after the guest had wrapped it, this person knew Bill Walton. And I don't want to say who it is, but uh, I asked them, I said, have you heard anything on Bill? And he says, you know, even if I had, I, I could, can't say anything. And it was just kind of like, not yeah. that anybody suspected it was like this, but the fact that Bill Walton hadn't been seen or heard from since February was was very concerning but have you ever, Shane, seen an outpouring of laughter and and praise for a man? Uh, I mean, that's past. So I, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, one of my favorite tweets, and I, I couldn't find it again, but I'm sort of paraphrasing. But my favorite tweets from after uh, Bill's passing was, and the best thing Bill about Bill Walton was that his, his side quest was all of his NCAA and NBA championships. Because how many people yeah. actually mentioned that first about Bill Walton? I mean, he guy's one of the most accomplished basketball players in the history of the sport. Mm -hmm. And we remember him for, for his commentary and, and his, uh, I call it eccentricness and his generosity and, and just being a genuinely good guy. So yeah, I was thinking about, um, you know, when we had him on and, and specifically before we started uh, recording, you know, you and I think he was probably a few minutes late joining us. He was trying to figure out some technical stuff and, um, you know, we're, we're cheap. So we only got the 40 minute free zoom interviews. Uh, and so we were about 10 minutes in and I said, uh, you know, he asked, how much time do you guys have? And I said, well, I think we got about 25, 30 minutes or so. So we should be good. And he said, no, 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 no. You'll, you'll want the four, the full 40 minutes. So we, we just, we, we all left that zoom and then we just restarted it so we could restart, uh, essentially recycle the full, um, 40 minutes. And then he, I remember he specifically asked, uh, double checked what our names are and in, in the middle of your intro, he he just cuts you off and talks about how legendary Eric and Shane are, and it's just. And I think we got in a total of four questions between the two of us, and of course, I don't think we actually got any of our questions directly answered. He took it in, in whatever direction he wanted, but it was just, it was the Bill Walton show. It's like it's partly an act with him, but it's also partly who he is, and he kind of just plays it up because he knows that's what that's that's what uh, people remember him for and know him for best. So uh, he will be greatly missed. Uh, I've seen so many great tributes to him. Um, and you know, the, everyone's noted that, you know, the pack, the end of the pack 12 and then Bill Walton passing. I mean, it seems kind of fitting in a way, which I don't like mm -hmm. to get into that too much because I'm sure that's the last thing his family's thinking about, but everyone had that thought. Um, but he will be missed. And I, look, I, I won't pretend like I didn't always love his commentary because I talked about it. I like in the late yeah. game, I'd, I'd rather someone focus on the great, like if it's a close game between Arizona and UCLA, I'd rather someone focus on what's going on in the court than all this other stuff away from the court. But he loved the game. He loved the the people he worked with. He was a genuinely humble man. Uh, loved his kids, obviously, you know, uh, uh, Luke who, who, who started Arizona. Uh, and um, it, is, it is a loss to the basketball community to, and you know, the NBA, NCAA broadcasting, uh, you know, music, the Grateful Dead, all of the above are going to miss Bill Walton quite a bit. You know, the first time that I saw Bill Walton in person uh, was actually in front of the student union. And he was yeah. walking along, having both hands holding a bag. And this was uh, when I was a student, probably 2003-ish or so. But I think in 2004, um, I was it was after a, a game and I walked into Payway on University and I was with a buddy of mine who I actually played golf with this weekend. We were talking about it uh, even before, uh, you know, Bill passed away. And 
how we were the only two in payway along with Lori and Bill, uh, his wife. And, and we didn't bother him. We were sitting a few tables away and we just said, Hey, Mr. Walton, and he couldn't have been nicer. And I'm glad that I told him when we did that interview, I said, you were a true gentleman. And that's how I would describe yeah, Bill Walton. Absolutely. He was a true gentleman for all that he was on the air and crazy. He was an entertainer and a good man. And yeah. I think when you look at the tributes that you've seen, you know, I mean, I've never, as we've discussed already, I've never seen anybody revered in death like Bill Walton has been. I mean, ever from all walks of life, that's how many people he touched. And I think to yeah, just to think about it, like, don't we wish we could live a third, a quarter, a fifth of the life that Bill Walton did and, and to make an effect and an impact on people, it just even a fraction of what he did. He was a good man. And, and this is a big loss. Uh, the world isn't as good of a place now without yeah. Bill Walton. No. And, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, we had the, the midst of a lot of political turmoil in the country and globally and the presidential election coming up. You know, one of the things he said in the lecture he gave is, you know, you can disagree without being disagreeable. And I think that is is probably the best legacy that he can leave is that, you know, he had his own opinions, but he did, he never frowned on those who disagreed with him. He he was open to all ideas and, and all points of view, um, whether it was basketball or anything else he liked talking about during, uh, during those broadcasts. So, and that's something that I will do my best to remember going forward and something I think we can all uh, keep, keep close to us as, uh, as we move on uh, through this presidential election and, and beyond. It is going to be a void when watching Arizona basketball next year or UCLA basketball. And there's no Bill Walton. I mean, let's be honest, when when the Arizona UCLA game came and Richard Jefferson was calling it, I mean, it was fun broadcast. I know you didn't like it as much, but well, we, I, I I did. I just I could understand why UCLA fans were pissed about it. That was my only thing. You know, it wasn't the same without Bill Wall. And so yeah. he will be missed. And we just wanted to memorialize him and, and really how fortunate we were. You know, I met him a couple of times and, you know, got a, I got a picture with him or two, but. Yeah. Um, that's a nice picture we were... you posted on your on your Twitter page a couple of days ago. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it was with my friend Amy and, and my friend Steve, who's a listener to the podcast. And he said, Bill says, uh, says to me, are, are you her dad? I mean, come on. She's, <laughs> you know, she's two years younger than I am. But it was it was pretty funny. He was just trying to, you know, be funny. With that said, uh, it was uh, he was a good man. Now we're going to talk. We're going to try to transition. We're going to talk a lot. Uh, it's a big about, uh, you know, a lot of random topics regarding Arizona athletics, uh, shotgun Spratling from D1baseball.com going to break it down. And he is very thorough, as we remember, when mm -hmm. it comes to talking everything baseball. But first, it is time for uh, what is now known as Buy or Sell, which is presented by our friends at iShaker. Go to iShaker.com, use promo code Wildcat Country, capital W, capital C, and get $5 off uh, your purchase. And by the way, when you do that, make sure to fill out the post-purchase survey and mention Shane and myself, and we'll be very happy with you. Now, and I'll just I'll just mention real quick, Eric, that that we are pleased to announce that we are extending our partnership with Ice Shaker through the end of at least the end of 2024, and we're very excited about that. And a big thanks to Chris Gronkowski and his team for uh, uh, sticking with us. All right, well, and thank you to Chris for that. Now let's talk a little baseball here, Shane. Uh, Arizona got the number 13 overall seed after winning an exciting Pac-12 tournament. The last. Pac-12 sporting event ever, which is just wild to think about. But number one in buy or sell, the NCAA baseball committee got it right in making Arizona a regional host. Yeah, I, you know, I pride myself on being an anti-homer, but it's kind of tough with this. Um, but I, I I will buy it. And, I, you know, I could have gone either way. I think the bottom line is the selection committee decided that conference championships mean something. And winning both the conference regular season and tournament titles and playing the toughest non-conference schedule in the country was enough. And I certainly don't think that's unreasonable. Uh, I know a lot of fans, including a certain team in Starkville, who I've been going back and forth with on social media the last couple of days, uh, they've lost their minds a little bit about a team like Arizona being in ahead of them. Uh, I know, it, you know, Arizona had an RPI of 31, so that was the big question. Not a lot of uh, quad one wins, um, three, nine, and quad one games. Uh, and I know Mississippi State played in a very tough conference, has a lot of quality wins. They also had a bunch of losses. Uh, and then like we talked about in basketball, there's no downside to playing a tough schedule, but Mississippi state didn't really have a choice as far as the toughest teams they played because they, they were in that conference and they barely went above 500 in those games. 
And meanwhile, they had a non-conference strength of schedule uh, outside of 100. Now, they're not the only team that has a gripe. You know, DBU, which is in Arizona's region, has a gripe as well. But I, I like that they, that certain teams were not rewarded simply for playing and losing to a lot of good teams. And I think Arizona, you know, either the bottom line is either winning your conference means something or it doesn't. And the selection committee says it does. And I am I think that's a perfectly legitimate uh, way to look at things. Yeah, right. So I actually think they got it right. Just very simply, as you said, Shane, when you win the regular season and postseason tournament for a, for a, a power conference, you cannot deny that team hosting. Now, the metrics uh, outside of, you know, the RPI and such, uh, did they favor Arizona? Absolutely not. We'll ask Shotgun in the next segment his thoughts on things. But no, I mean, from that perspective, Arizona didn't deserve it. But you cannot deny what they did in the re- in the regular season in conference and, it, and then in the postseason tournament, albeit they got kind of fortunate with the way it shook out. I mean, they lost to Cal on Friday night, but took care of business on Saturday and Sunday, and uh, good for them. Uh, but with that said, Shane, they also kind of got a brutal draw, don't you think? Oh, yeah. No, that's not an easy one. You know, And we could just start with the team they're going to face first, uh, the Grand Canyon, which beat Arizona two out of three games this season. Uh, yeah. Last time they played, they got smoked. 24 to eight in Tucson by Grand Canyon. And, you know, I know GCU, as a lot of fans have pointed out, GCU didn't have to face one of Arizona's trio of outstanding uh, starting pitchers, but still you allow 24 runs at home. It's not exactly a comforting thing heading into a a rematch. And GCU has a team batting average of 311, which is 23rd uh, nationally. And for those who don't know, uh, GCU received an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament, even though they lost in the WAC tournament, because the eventual winner, Tarleton State, uh, is still new to Division One, and as such isn't yet eligible for the postseason, which begs the question, what was the point of allowing them to compete in that tournament in the first place? But GCU won the regular season conference title, so by default they were selected to take Tarleton State, uh, Tarleton State's place in regionals. But then beyond that, you have uh, Dallas Baptist, which is a team that a lot of people thought should have hosted. Uh, they have one of the best pitchers in the country in Ryan Johnson, who has the nation's uh, second best ERA, just under two. Um, hopefully he start. I think he's going to start against West Virginia. So hopefully Arizona gets to avoid him. Uh, but DBU is also 15th in the nation in slugging percentage. And West Virginia also has a uh, team batting average uh, north of 300. So it is a, va- a very challenging draw. And uh, Chip Hale has an interesting decision to make. Uh, as far as who's going to start that g- first game against GCU, considering that Jackson Kent, their number one pitcher, um, their number one starter for most of the season, uh, has been struggling a bit recently. All right. Uh, I don't feel overly optimistic <laughs> that Arizona's going to come out. I mean, I'm just uh, honestly. Um, and I'm from you, that says a lot because you're a pretty optimistic guy. Uh, you know, I just was kind of sitting here looking at the metrics of things. I mean, Dallas Baptist is a pretty darn good team. And you're like, who the heck is that? They are consistently in the NCAA tournament. They have an RPI yeah. of 17. They were 44 and 13 this year. Beat Arizona you know, earlier in the season as well. Yeah, yeah I, I think they're going to uh, – they would be my pick. Now, I hope Arizona proves me wrong. I I think the Wildcats will get by Grand Canyon, and I think they will lose a couple to Dallas Baptist and, and not advance. I But even if that happens, I'm not upset. What they did yeah. and the memories that they made, are so worth it. And oh, I yeah. know it's corny to say, well, they didn't win anything in the postseason. This isn't basketball. This is a team that had no expectations whatsoever. We yeah. were calling for Chip Hale's head, and they won the last Pac-12. I don't season. know about we were calling I, I was, for I okay. was. I'm sorry. I was. I was. And I obviously I was wrong uh, in doing that. But with that said, yeah, I, I think Arizona has done great. I don't think they advanced past this weekend. How about you, Shane? Uh, I, I lean that way as well. I probably go DBU as well. Um, I, I think they're probably put it this way. I think Arizona deserved to host a regional, but DBU is probably the best team in the region. If, if that makes sense. Now I, to your point though, about, you know, it, it'd be a great season, even if, if they don't advance chip Hale, he had a, uh, a press conference uh, after the brackets were announced. And he said, no, we're not satisfied. You know, maybe the, after the season, we'll look at it that way. But right now it's like, we're, everything's still in front of us essentially is what he said. So I, I like that perspective, but I also like that while, you know, Arizona, I, I still am questioning whether they're a college world series contender, mainly because they've won a lot of close games and they've also gotten blown out a few times, but good team. Number one, good teams find ways to win close games. And number mm-hmm. two, I like that this team has the, I'm sure they have the belief 
when they're behind late that they can find ways to win because they have so many times, you know, they're yeah. down, didn't get a hit first six innings against USC and they win that they're behind the ninth inning against Oregon state uh, with a Pac-12 title on the line and they come behind and win. So they have that belief that they're never out of a game. And I think that matters this time of year as well. So I would be shocked that they got out of the region, but I think it's going to come down to Arizona and, and Dallas Baptist. If nothing else, I hope Arizona gets past GCU. You know, we, we've had a kind of a feel good relationship, Arizona and GCU. Yeah. If GCU were to get past Arizona and maybe that some of that, those good feelings go away. So just for the sake of our relationship, I think Arizona needs to win that, win that game. But uh, I, I think it probably comes down to Arizona and Dallas Baptist and Dallas Baptist. I would lean toward um, uh, coming out of the, the region, but the good news is I'm wrong a lot and hopefully I'll be wrong about this too. All right, uh, let's transition to ba uh, to basketball. Caleb Love, we're supposed to get some clarity on his decision. Now, he has until the middle of June, but I know he was working out on Wednesday or Tuesday or Wednesday with the uh, Portland Trailblazers. Trailblazers. Yeah. Your gut feeling, are you buying that he comes back or are you selling? The only thing I have to go on is what Matt Moreno told us last week, which is he's leaning toward him coming back, I, I believe is what Matt said. Um, so I'll, I'll go with that. I, I think that he, he, there's no reason for, for him not to go through the motions and try to impress a team. And if, and if someone gets back to him and says, Hey, we think maybe you'll, you'll be a first, late first round pick, then it would probably be worth it for him financially and otherwise to, to make the move. If he doesn't get that, which I'm guessing he probably wouldn't, then I think he comes back because I, I think it's kind of a, a Dale and Terry situation again, where if he bets on himself and thinks it'd be a first round pick, then he'll go. And it worked out for Dale and Terry. Um, and if he, if he thinks that it's probably a second round pick or not a pick at all, then he'll probably come back because of the NIL situation. So uh, I don't have a gut feeling about it. Other, you know, I just kind of go with what people who know more than me do. And if Matt Moreno says that he's more likely to come back. And I would guess I was kind of feeling that way to begin with, if I had to pick one, then I guess I'll go ahead and stick with that. All right. I was feeling really good that he was going to come back. I don't know why. I'm just the last few days I'm kind of changing it. I would say, yeah, 60, 40 that he comes back. So I'm going to slight by, but like a few weeks ago, it's like 80, 20 is mm -hmm. how I felt. Now with love or Josan Sanan coming in, Jamari Phillips likely to leave. I know he was one of Arizona's recruits, but really there's no room for him. So if, you know, there, there's been rumors of that. I, I haven't seen anything official, um, but there's kind of a roster crunch there and Phillips, you know, wants to play. So if that were to be true, and I obviously don't have any inside info at the moment, no. uh, is this a notable loss for Arizona? Well, it depends on who on is, is are Love and Sanan both going to play? You know, if Love comes no, back. They, Sanan... they're, not, they're not both going to be on the so, team. So if Love is moves on and Sanan plays, then, then Phillips might, I mean, he, I, I would think Phillips, he, he it doesn't, he, there's no way Shane that he's in the top nine in the rotation. You don't think so? No, no I, I, mean, I don't you, know. You, I mean, cause you're you, talking about three shooting guards with love and Phillips and Sonata. I, I, I get that. Um, I guess it depends on how quickly he wants to play in the, in the NBA. Um, well, but, but there, but so there's only enough minutes. You got Bradley. Yeah. So you think about the right. So you got Bradley, uh, love or Sonata. I'm going to say one or the other KJ Lewis, uh, Del Orso, who they got. Then you have Trey Townsend, Trey Townsend yeah. Toby Awaka, um, Kree Voss. Maybe Henry Vasar in the mix. I mean, right. So, yeah. like, I, I just don't know that if there are minutes, uh, Conrad Martinez is probably going to get something. Maybe they go out and get another grad transfer. But Phillips, really, you haven't heard anything about him at all through the offseason, you know? Yeah. No, and, and that's possible. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much that matters at this time of year. Um, you know, I always go – the example I always think about is Sean Miller's first class at Arizona, where Derek Williams was the lowest rated of the five and Kirill Yazuko was the highest rated of the five. And then you go True. and see what happens. Yeah. So, um, but you, you think that, okay, if, if, if Phillips was okay when Sanan committed and maybe he's assuming Caleb Love leaves and he still goes on to leave, then, then maybe he would come back. But then, you know, we don't, Tommy Lloyd likes to keep a pretty tight rotation. He usually likes to find eight guys, maybe a ninth yeah. if he has to. And so maybe he's going to Tommy Lloyd and say, Hey, based on, make up this roster. Where do you think I stand? And Tommy Lloyd would probably be straight with him. And if he doesn't like what he hears, then maybe he moves on. But, uh, uh, well, I, I'm kind of waiting to, I know this is boring, but I'm kind of just waiting to, to, to make heads or tails out of it based on what happens in the next couple of weeks. But, uh, I agree with you. I think it's, it's pretty close to a coin flip with Caleb love. Um, let me ask you this though. Would, would you rather, uh, have Sanan over, over Caleb love, or, or would you rather have another season of Caleb love? 
Um, it depends. Here's the thing. How long are we going to have Sanan for? Like if I, yeah. if I knew we could get two years of Sanan or more, yeah, but probably yes. taking him. Sure. Um, but if I knew if he, if he's maybe a one and done, yeah, then, then I'd probably take Caleb at that point. So, That's fair. Uh, That's fair. we'll, we'll have more to discuss on that in the coming weeks. All right. Number three. So I was coming across these tweets here. I, I saved this one. Um, this, this, uh, Twitter named college football reported has uh, 81,000 followers on there. Uh, they ranked the Power four conference coaching hires, starting with one Kalen DeBoer at Alabama, two Jed Fish, and number 14, behind UCLA at 13 and Deshaun Foster, is Brent Brennan. Are you buying or selling this list, Shane? Okay, so I think this is one of these accounts that acts like it's some sort of official account with a check mark that you can buy now on Elon Musk's platform. Mm-hmm. But really, is just some dude with an opinion, you know. And I and you know this this is kind of like you know I don't know this is discount big big game boomer or the other way around. Uh, but I looked at it since you put it on the list and you sent it um, behind Deshaun Foster. That's something. Um, that's really something. I, that's something. I, I cannot I cannot get behind that. Yeah, I I don't know. I I think you, you, there are certainly guys. I. I'm sorry. I'm struggling with it because I just feel like it's clickbait more than anything else. I, I think the guy, I mean, Kalen DeBoer being on the top there, Jonathan Smith toward the, uh, toward the top. I, I don't have a problem with, uh, Jet Fish is number two on this list, which is, I have a problem with that. Yeah. I don't okay, know. I, I don't, I don't know about that, but, um, I, uh, to Matt Moreno's point, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the top, uh, recruits that Arizona's going after, they're taking a wait and see approach. It's like, yeah, I like everything that Brent Brennan and the staff are selling. And, and I like the, you know, the, the program and the direction it's going, but I haven't seen him coach at Arizona yet. And so yeah. you're going to get this kind of opinion and, and that that's, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm doing my best to care about this. Um, I, I think having him ahead of Deshaun Foster is a little crazy um, ahead of um, I don't know, Willie Fritz. I don't know, but I mean, it's a stupid. Look. I mean, yeah. there's no point. I've, I've just uh, Brent Brennan uh, did a pretty darn good job at San Jose state. I would put him in the middle of this list. Uh, this is yeah. a really stupid. stupid well, and, and anyone, anyone at this point, and I don't think there are many people, but anyone at this point who's just looking at Brett Brennan's record at San Jose state and saying, well, he had a losing record. So what did he do there? Like, do you realize number one, he had a winning season three out of four, his last four years. And number two, San Jose state is not a, a hub for winning college football Correct. to put yeah. it mildly. Okay. And yeah. if we're going to play that game, by the way, then Jed fish is a lousy head coach. Cause he went below 500 at Arizona. You need context. And so yeah. while I think it's fair to say, well, we're just not sure how Brent Brennan's going to do it at a power, a power school. That's fine. I don't know either, you know, and, and, and we're going to gonna have to wait and find out together, but these kinds of lists, um, if I, if I'm forced to take them seriously, I certainly don't think he would, I don't think he's going to end up being the worst of these 14, <laughs> these 14 hires. I think he's going to be in the top half. There are rumors. Uh, Dick, Dick Weiss, who's a notable uh, writer. I think he's retired now uh, tweeted out uh, on May 25th that there's speculation in college sports that Utah may possibly move to the ACC despite its recent move to the big 12. Now they came out, Utah came out and said, that's a garbage report. Da, da, da. Mm-hmm. I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire. All right. So if Utah were to move, and that would obviously trigger another round of realignment, whenever that is. Yeah. Where would you want Arizona to go? Would you say Big 12? Would you say ACC, even though the geography doesn't make sense? Would you say uh, Big 10? Or would you say SEC? So if Arizona had to go somewhere other than where they're at no, right they, now, they could stay the in the front. Big 12. Uh, of the four conferences, if Arizona had the opportunity to move again, yeah. Would you stay put or would you go elsewhere? Well, it's hard for me to talk from the financial perspective of money it. being um, equal. Let's, let's assume equal. money. Okay. Yeah. Money I, being I, equal. I mean, I, I kind of, I th- kind of think the big 12 is the best fit of the, other than the PAC 12, which isn't obviously isn't an option anymore. Um, geographically it, it, I mean, it, it makes the most sense based on the f- four options, which, you know, none of which are, I mean, the ACC certainly doesn't didn't stop Stanford and Cal, but it doesn't make mm-hmm. sense. SEC doesn't. And the big 10, it's mostly um, you know, Midwest. Uh, so no, I, I think big 12 makes the most sense. You got teams in, you know, for recruiting purposes as well in football, you got a bunch of teams in Texas, you got Oklahoma, you got Kansas. Um, and so, and, and I think just, I'm legitimately excited as, as sad as I am to see the Pac-12 go. 
I am legitimately excited to see Arizona men's basketball in the big 12. Okay. It's going to be a great, I, I think that's a great fit. And I, like we talked about last week, I know you're scared of Arizona playing tough teams, but I like that they're going to have to play a lot of tough teams. And I think that's going to toughen them up come March. I think that's going to be a big benefit. Uh, so from that perspective, from the football perspective, I, I think that, I think that's the best fit. I, I think we are going to see more realignment. I, I think that we're not done. I think we're going to see more consolidation. I don't know. If yeah, we're the ACC see... is going to come apart at some point. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if we're going to see two or three big mega conferences, and then I would be surprised after all the dust settles that we had just end up with like more regional conferences anyway, and just you know have these mega conferences with these different divisions, and essentially it's the same thing as we always as we had just you know with different affiliations. But if you're asking me um, if I could put Arizona in any of the Big Four conferences, I think the Big Twelve makes the most sense for the reasons I just mentioned. I think if Arizona could get in the Big Ten, you take it. Just just saying that. Uh, and I don't even think it's close. Um, just to be able to play those schools, uh, the revenue it would bring in. I mean, you bring in Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State to Tucson, uh, it sells out. Uh, no question about it. So, well, yeah, it sell out with Ohio State and Michigan fans because you know how many uh, Big I, I Ten care. people like, are. The re- yeah. fine. The revenue is the revenue. You remember the point. Iowa game in 2010? The whole well, we're gonna was gold. We're gonna we're gonna talk about 2010 as that's the year we're gonna discuss in our uh, in our last segment. But I have one for you. You don't know what this question is. There are six schools, Shane, that made a bowl game, the NCAA tournament in men's and women's basketball, and then the postseason in baseball and softball. Arizona is one of six. Can you name the other five off the top of your head? Well, it's funny you mentioned this because I actually retweeted this and I don't remember what it was. Uh, I want to say Alabama is one of them. That's one. Um, and I don't remember the others. <laughs> so Duke is one. Duke, uh, yeah. t- yep. Texas and Texas A&M and Tennessee. So okay. you've got Tennessee, Alabama, Duke. Uh, A&M and Texas and Arizona. There you go. That's a hell of a list right there. Yeah, there, anyway, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the down. tweets. Yeah, the... Uh, 12 schools made uh, a bowl game, the men's basketball and baseball tournaments. And Arizona was one of those. But if you narrow it down uh, to women's basketball and softball, then that list is cut in half to the six that you mentioned. So remarkable uh, season, uh, athletic season. I mean, you can, it, it's easy to think about the things that weren't accomplished, you know, or the, the you know, sad things like Jed Fish leaving or, you know, men's basketball team for, falling short of the final four again. But you know, we are pretty darn lucky to be Arizona Wildcats fans because we've had a lot of entertainment, a lot of very good times, and a lot of competitive teams. And it, is, it doesn't even include men's tennis. And I know men's tennis isn't the most exciting yeah. program, but we and we we haven't even mentioned uh, uh, Colton Smith making the uh, the the final four in an individual uh, in NCAA championships and very close to to making the championship game. So, a lot of things to cheer about. And plenty to talk about. And we are very fortunate to be Arizona fans, even though we will never, ever be satisfied. Yeah. And, and congrats to the uh, softball team because they, yeah. you know, they won a, a re- they won their regional yeah. and they got, you know, they played Oklahoma State and it didn't go so well. But hey, no. they, they did, you know, more. Here's the interesting thing. Can Arizona baseball win a game in the postseason? If so, then all five teams, all five of your biggest teams on campus will have won a postseason game. Because yeah. if you count the, the women's basketball uh, play-in game, that counts as a, as a win. ASU likes to count it for their men's basketball team. So uh, pretty darn uh, exciting to think about that. Now, uh, once again, Wildcat Country is brought to you by Harris Auction and Casino. Shane is talking about bringing his family out there this summer. He probably will do so, I, yeah. I would think. Uh, and we would hope that you would do the same. I, I, I hope to go out there as well. Because Harris Auction is the only Valley Casino with Caesars Rewards, the player's card that pays for Vegas and more. In fact, the reward credits you earn with Caesars Rewards can be redeemed for hotel stays, dining, and more at 50 destinations across the country, including Las Vegas, like Tahoe, New Orleans, and dozens of others. Sign up, play, and earn Caesars Rewards only at Harris Auction Casino. One card, 50 destinations to enjoy your perks. It is an awesome time out there. We'll have GM uh, Mike Kintner on sometime this summer. But uh, make sure to check it out because there's a lot of great things going on at Harris Auction Casino. A lot of great things going on with Arizona baseball. And coming up next, Shotgun Spratling from D1Baseball.com. Going to preview it all for us here on Wildcat Country. What's up, Wildcat Country? Chris Gronkowski here, and I'm at the Ice Shaker Warehouse, the proud sponsor of the Wildcat Country podcast. And I got something new and exciting to show you. We're talking about the 4D printed University of Arizona 
shaker bottles with the legacy championships on it. Check it out now at iceshaker.com. Shane, he has the best name of anyone we've had on the program in the four years we've done this. Shotgun Spratling for the second straight year from D1Baseball.com. You know, we didn't really think that we'd be talking Arizona baseball come late May, like in January. We, we just figured, okay, this is one of those throwaway years. And yet, now they're hosting a regional. Shotgun, first of all, glad to have you back on the show. Number two, did the NCAA Tournament Committee get it right in giving Arizona a regional in the this time? I mean, you can look at it both ways. I'll, I'll say that, uh, you know, I think if you win the Pac-12 regular season championship, you win the Pac-12 tournament championship, that is a great start of a resume just to begin with. Now you look at the rest of the resume and being at 31 RPI, I was very surprised to see it happen because the NCA has been, has been using the RPI as such a crutch recently, especially with when it comes to choosing the at-large teams, but then especially when it came to the host, um, you know, it's basically been teams have been in the top 20 and no one else has been outside of it, but it helps when you have a friend uh, in the selection committee room, as we saw extremely this week, this, uh, this season with how the at large the bubble teams went but for Arizona having Mark Harlan who obviously uh, two-time alum from Arizona worked at, at Arizona for a long time to have him in the room I'm sure that did not hurt them and he's one guy that he could root for his team in those rooms because you know they, they this was a question that came up in the selection committee or in the uh, interviews we had with the chair um, afterwards is you know what happens you know they follow the protocols of course yeah every, if you, if your team's being discussed they got to step out of the room. Mark Harlan can stay in the room when it's Arizona because that's technically not his program anymore. So having him in the room, I'm sure, did not hurt them at all. But they earned it by going to Scottsdale and a team that was already in the tournament, going in there and finding a way to win, finding a way the final game of the regular season to rally to beat Oregon State. Lost two games, down, you know, Oregon State takes the lead, find a way to come back and get that regular season title, and then – to do the same thing, same score against USC, find a way to rally in the ninth inning and come through with a walk-off winner, dramatic fashion. And once again, the Wildcats, I think this is their eighth walk-off winner of the season. They continue to find ways to win, and that's why they will be hosting. And that means you get the juice box revved up, you know, get some uh, get some jams pumping because uh, the, the Cats are going to be in, in business, even though it's going to be a very tough regional going against the, the teams that are in that regional. But they, no place you'd rather be playing in a tough regional than at home. Yeah, we'll definitely get to that in, in a sec. I, I just want to get an idea, Shotgun, of what you th- make of this Arizona team overall. You know, they were picked to finish ninth out of 11 Pac-12 teams. They obviously overachieved, won on a big winning streak in the middle of the season. Like you said, they've won a lot of close games. I believe you said eight walk-off wins. I've heard nine, so a, a lot, which suggests – there's not a lot of margin for error. They find ways to win, but not a lot of margin for error with this team. Would you put this team more on the side of legit college world series contender or a team that's pl- maybe played above its talent level. And maybe for that reason is, is likely to come down to earth at some point during the postseason. No, I think they're definitely a legit uh, college world series contender because unlike many teams in the country, they have three legit starters. And that's been the biggest difference. And that's why they were picked so low is that we didn't really know what to expect out of Clark Candy had it coming in. It was, I think it was his fourth school in four years or something like that. Um, Cam Walty being a Nevada transfer to have to be able to put him on Sundays has been terrific because to close out a weekend, I think it is really big to have him. And he's been probably their best guy recently. And then Jackson Kent has really developed it and been really good. He's a big question mark going forward, though, because he struggled a, a bit recently. But the fact that they have three guys, uh, you know, Jackson Kent's got a three and four record with a 408 ERA. And in college baseball these days, that's really good. And his is the worst of the three. That has been the big difference maker for them. And that's allowed them, the fact that those three guys can give them innings, that's allowed them to grow as an offense because they've got young guys that are talented but haven't really had the experience guys that have, you know, have a chance that could be down the league, be big leaguers, but they're still growing into it. You know, the Easton Bry Fogles, the, you know, Maddox Michalakis is just hits the ball hard all the time when he hits the ball, he's got to make contact with it. They've had some injuries a long way, all those things. You got a true superstar in Mason white, but the rest of the, the lineup, it was kind of like, okay, who's going to perform? Who's going to do what? And the pitching staff has carried them, enabled them to be able to, to grow throughout the season to become the group that is capable of making a run to the college world series. Yeah. 
Speaking of those three pitchers, uh, uh, Jackson, like he's been great most of the season. He's been struggling lately. The other two have been, been pretty sharp down the stretch. It's Jackson's turn in the rotation if they want to keep things the same way that way it's been, meaning he'd start Arizona's first game of the regionals against Grand Canyon, which smacked Arizona in the mouth last time they came to Tucson. Put yourself in Chip Hale's shoes. Would would you mix it up a bit? Maybe have Candiotti or Walty start that game, or would you stick with the, the rotation as is? It's a very tough question because you go with the guy that's kind of gotten you there, but it's scuffling a little bit. I think at this time of the year is the time when you have to mix things up if you feel like it's necessary. Um, and, and, you know, if if – if you can't diagnose and correct the issue and the biggest thing for him, uh, I'm trying to find my article on it, but uh, d- it's been his changeup early in the season before, you know, he, he was down to, I think a two something ERA about a month ago and his changeup was pretty much unhittable. The hitters were batting, I think 189 against it since then. So his changeup has been getting hit and hit hard. He given up 14 hits on it in the last three starts before the PAC 12 tournament uh, start. Um, and seven of those have been for extra bases. Five doubles, two homers. He had only given up, you know, three homers on the season. And I think only one of those on a changeup, if if any. And he's had given up two and out of seven extra base hits. When he I think he'd only given up seven hits total before that. So the changeup has been the big deal. Getting it down in the zone to be able to work off his fastball has been an issue for him. It's been riding up, and they've got to be able to figure out, diagnose that issue and say, all right, let's make a change. Because the big thing is. You, you got to win those first two games. You know, that, that sets you up so well for the rest of it. But you don't want to burn your bullpen by having to go to them super early in that first game. So, you know, if you're looking at it and, and you feel like everyone is is healthy enough that they can just, you know, you can bump, uh, potentially bump Jackson Kent to your third starter, that may be an option. And now that's the tough question. Um, is, is it something, and that's something you got to look at uh, as the week goes along, as you're doing your, your bullpens and stuff is, can we get this issue fixed with him or should we make a change and give him an extra couple of, an extra couple of days rest by pushing him back and having him be the third day starter? And then the fact that if you can go to and O, you're in the driver's seat then as far as you're into the championship, you're in the driver's seat, you're waiting for an opponent type of thing while they're using all their pitching. And then if you do go to Jackson Kent, if you feel like it, it, you see early, it's not going well, you can have a quick hook and you should have all your bullpen arm, or you should have a lot of bullpen arms because you should have gotten linked out of Walty and Candiotti and the two starts before that. So I think that's the move that you do make. If you don't feel confident that you've gotten things fixed during this week, that it's a tough decision to make. And it's tough because that's a guy you've counted on, but those other two guys have been really good all season too. And you, you got to go with, with whoever's playing best at this time of season. Shotgun did the NCAA do Arizona dirty with a region of Dallas Baptist. Who's a pretty darn good team, West Virginia. And of course, GCU who has played the Wildcats very tough this year. I don't think they did them dirty. I mean, it is one of the tougher regions for sure. But, uh, you know, when when you're going into the weekend or going into selection uh, Monday and thinking or selection Sunday for them, for the regional host, that you're not going to get a regional host or you're on the bubble, you don't really complain about who comes to see you then. You yeah. know, so the fact that, you know, they were one of the last teams to kind of clinch that regional host position, the fact that they got a tough regional is something you can't really complain about. Uh, you know, it, it should be, it'll be a challenge for sure. Dallas Baptist is a team that, you know, is not too far away. You know, something that Arizona, I believe has played in the in the past couple of years, I've played them every once in a while. So to get a chance to see them, they are a team that was looking to try to host themselves. And it's going to be interesting. You're going to see a true Friday arm from them uh, and Ryan Johnson. So the fact that they don't have to face them is a positive there. And, the, you know, West Virginia is a scrappy team. Their head coach is his final year. Randy Mazie has already announced his, his retirement. So they're going to be coming in with something really big to play for. And how about Grand Canyon? Second life. They get put out of the WAC championship and think, all right, our season's done. And they get renewed life because Tarleton State wins it and because of the dumb NCAA rules about yep. transitions that they still have. This is the final year of their transition period from Division Two. So because of that, it revert because they win the tournament, it reverts back to the regular season champion is, yep. is how it's set up in the WAC and the and GCU. So they're going to be coming in playing with house money, I feel like. So it is going to be a challenge. And GCU did take the season series against Arizona. Yep. The last time they played was a while back. So I think that Arizona has really turned it on at the end of the season. And GCU, um, the, the real question for them will be what starting pitching do they give? 
do they get, excuse me, because uh, Daniel Vidia has been their Friday guy at the beginning of the season. He went through some struggles. He has legit stuff. He has draft pick stuff if they can get him back healthy and in that Friday slot. I don't know if that's exactly what they're going to do. They've got Grant Richardson, a big lefty, that maybe that's who they use against Arizona because of all the left-handed bats in the Arizona lineup. And he's got, he again, another draft guy. He's going to be uh, in the draft as well a little bit later. So I think that they have some options there. And this is a team that is used to the the – the spotlight, you know, with all the players they had last year with, uh, um, with Jacob, um, uh, Jacob, I'm blanking, blanking on his name, Jacob Wilson as uh, the top 10 pick and all the guys on that team, they have the, the, the whack player of the year once again, and Tyler Wilson this year. So they've got some dudes and they're going to be ready and they're, they know that they can beat Arizona because they've done it so far this season. So it's not like they're going to be intimidated by the, the, the circumstances. Now, a couple of years ago when they came to Tucson, it was their first time ever getting into the NCAA tournament. Maybe that was a little bit different this year. I don't expect them to be intimidated at all coming in facing, you know, a, a packed house or anything. So GCU is definitely one to watch out for, but I don't think you complain about it. If you're too, if, if you're the wildcats about who's coming to you, you're just happy to have the fact that you can sleep in your own bed and you get to play uh, at your home field. That's a great point, and I will not complain about that again. Now, <laughs> I don't want to look too far ahead, but the way the committee did it, in the event that the defending national champion LSU were to upset <laughs> UNC in Chapel Hill and Arizona were to win their region, it would be Jay Johnson and LSU at Arizona. Just talk about, from a national perspective, that's a, that's a pretty cool storyline, isn't it? Oh, that's definitely a fun one. You know, anytime you get a coach who uh, who leaves – for what they see as greener pastures and the, the fact that it wasn't a firing, it was someone leaving to go to a job they saw as a step up. And, you know, it wasn't taken well in, in Tucson to for him to walk out after what he had done at the pro with with Arizona and taking them to a college world series and everything. But uh, you, there's definitely some, some uh, no love lost there between the Arizona fans. The fact that Jay Johnson kind of turned his back on Arizona and went to LSU so the potential of that is juicy for sure. Um, now, will that happen? That's the big question. I got LSU winning that one. They are hot right now, and their pitching is pitching well right now. And where is that pitching coming from? Not homegrown talent, but from the transfer portal. Luke Holman coming from South Carolina, or excuse me, from Alabama, transferring over after their coach left. But also they have two former UCLA pitchers, and Gage Jump has been really good for them recently, the big lefty for, that came from UCLA. So it'll be up to their start in pitching if they can work their way through that, that regional. North Carolina has won a ton of close games, a ton of games with uh, with against quality opponents. They have won uh, you know their big-time matchups in the ACC. They seem to win all those, even when there are tight games and stuff. So it's going to be challenging for LSU to go in there and do that. But if they do, and Arizona's able to take care of business in Tucson, that's definitely one I'll be looking at and definitely one I'll be petitioning uh, my, my bosses to see if I can fly out to, to cover that one. Fortunately, we Wildcat fans took it a lot better when Jed Fish left. But if we, <laughs> we, 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 we did. All right, uh, Shotgun, a lot of people thought uh, DBU should be a host school in this tournament. Uh, like you mentioned, they have one of the best pitchers in college baseball with Ryan Johnson, who's got the nation's second best DRA. Uh, and then you got West Virginia and GCU, which are both um, batting over 300 as a team this season. Who's the favorite? Like, who do you? How do you see this this regional uh, playing out? And and who do you think advances? I mean, that's a great question. I, I think it's it is truly a toss up. I think I saw the odds. Uh, one of the betting sites sent me an email with with odds, and I think that um, GCU was one of the better had some one of the better odds for a four seed. So you know, like I said, they're not going to be scared. They're going to come into this, and it's not like they're going to an SEC country and it's someplace they've never been. It's good. The envi environment is going to be outstanding at Tucson. If they're going to have fans like, that make the trip as well. I guarantee you. they are. They're going to make the trip and they're going to be used to the confines. You know, high court plays unique compared to a lot of college stations with those giant alleys and how it plays. Well, Grand Canyon has been there before, so they know. Now you have an advantage on DBU and, uh, and West Virginia in that regard, but West Virginia's team had, in the past has been built on speed. Now I didn't see them this year. I saw them a bunch last year, um, but they have a superstar in J.J. Weatherholt. And if he was healthy the entire season, this is a team that would not be a three seed. He is going to be a top 10 pick. He is elite. He is going to be the player. If you don't know anything about him, you're going to want to stay and at least watch a couple of at-bats when after the, the Arizona game or before the Arizona game. If you get that all set, session pass, you want to come out and see J.J. Weatherholt because 
He is fun to watch. He gets on. He's going to steal second. He may even steal third. Hell, he may even steal home. Uh, he, he's got power, second baseman, shortstop. He is an elite player, so he's going to be super fun to watch. And they've got other players around him. Logan Save is really good. Um, Ellis, their third baseman, has been really good. But it's going to be a super fun matchup. I know this is not Arizona-related, but it's going to be super fun that opening matchup pitching-wise because Ryan Johnson, big, bulky right-hander, is likely going to face Derek Clark who's like a 5'10 left-hander bulldog that just is a pitchability guy, doesn't throw it super hard, but is I think he's either led the nation or was right in the mix for complete games this season. He had I think at one point he had three in a row. Um, so very similar. Last year they brought in Blaine Traxel from CSUN, and he threw I think five or six complete games for West Virginia. They are not afraid of throwing out their guy. Um, and if, you know, if he can – if he can get by and it's a different look because it's a soft tossing guy, then, you know, if he throws off an offensive lineup, then they will ride with him. So we'll see how that goes in that first game with Derek Clark and see who gets in that winner's game to potentially face Arizona. Or, you know, if Arizona does lose to Green Canyon, who they're facing in that second matchup, because it, it could be really interesting. Both teams have some depth on the mound. Um, and West Virginia, when I saw them, like I said, two years ago, had a lot of young guys that were upcoming um, that they were really confident in. And so those guys are starting to mature. And those are the guys that came on l- late in the second half. There were guys that they were really counting on. So uh, some big arms there, not necessarily a, a, you know, an overwhelming amount or anything, but some guys with stuff for sure. All right. Last question for you, Shotgun. And we appreciate your time with the education. And I, I think everyone listening has learned a lot in the last 15 minutes or so. What do you think about the future of this program? You know, losing Jay Johnson, like like you guys talked about, was a big blow. But Chip Hale, who, you know, U of A alum, loves the university. He really seems to have gotten the program back on track. Do you, you think Arizona can maintain this level of play over the next several seasons under Chip Hale? Chip Hale went out and did what no one at Arizona previously did. He went out and built a team around pitching. And that's something that has not happened at High Corbett. It's always like, okay, let's get speedy guys um, you, you know, guys that can hit the ball in the alley uh, and, and can run for days, you know, whether it be your Kevin Newman's or uh, Scotty, I'm blanking on his name, the second baseman that was with, with Newman there. Like you get those guys and hit the ball and, and run for days and you get some pop. You get your Chase Davises, you get your your Tony Bullers, guys that can drive the ball in the by- ballpark and you beat teams with offense. That hasn't been the case this year. Now they've got some guys on the team. Like I said, Mason White is electric as a shortstop. Uh, he's shown this, you know, seeing him again at the Pac-12 tournament, seeing him play shortstop, it's like, okay, that's a that's a real dude at shortstop, not just second base. 19 homers, 65 RBIs this year. Brennan Summerhill is still learning. I, I think it's really interesting they have this Midwest contingent, and I talked a little bit with it about Trip Couch, uh, you know, the recruiting coordinator, about the guys they brought in, whether it be Brian Fogel, whether it be Summerhill, whether it be uh, Rogers, just guys they brought in from the Midwest that are super athletic guys. They're growing into it. They're projection guys. They're not the big bulky guys you see more in the Big Ten, and somehow those guys get overlooked a little bit in the Midwest um, from the Big Ten schools, and they've snapped them up, and, and, and those guys are the ones that are doing damage. And they're still learning. They're growing into it. And then you have guys like Tommy Splain, who's been around for for ages, it feels like, with Arizona. His swing has been changed three or four times this season, but he comes through with a huge hit, the game winner against USC. So hopefully that's a big springboard from him because he's a guy they think can uh, potentially be a pro guy in the future. So there's talent on the offensive side, but it's it's talent that's growing. And I think that's really something that is, is impressive about this group is they've gotten better and better and better as the season goes along. The, the group that's hitting, but also the pitching on the pitching side. Give Kevin Vance, the, the pitching coach they went out and, and took from um, Boston College. I've heard nothing but rave reviews uh, about him. And give Chip Hill credit because that's one of the things that's difficult when a former major league player comes in, not to mention a major league manager, but a player comes in, they think they kind of know everything, and usually there's a transition period. Whether it's a couple of years, whether it was Tony Gwynn at San Diego State, whether you know whether it was Lance Berkman at Houston uh, Baptist, it takes them a little bit of time to realize, okay, what exactly is really important? Um, Chad Cruder, when he went to USC, thought he could just recruit the best players, and he did that. 
and they all signed and went to the draft. So he didn't get any of those guys. And he was wondering where, why do I not have any talent on these teams? So it takes a little bit of time, but Chip Hale did an amazing job. Uh, first, keeping Dave Lon on to have that transition. I thought, I thought that was a big piece of it to help him understand the college game and the areas that they needed to attack, whether it be recruiting, whether it be different things. And then have built on it with Kevin Vance, with some of the pieces that they've added. I, I've been really impressed with what Chip Hale and, and that staff have done this season in particular, but just overall, taking the talent that they've had and, and continue to develop it. So they're developing talent. That's one. And they know what they're attacking now uh, and the way they're going about it. And, you know, Trip Couch, who's been around the game uh, over and over as a scout, as a coach in the SEC, around the bins. And he told me, this is the best manager I've ever worked under. He said he knows the game better than anyone else. And, how can you deny that that's true when he's, you know, a former big league manager in, in Chip Hill. Uh, but he said that, you know, he knows how to stay just steady throughout a game. He doesn't get over riled up, doesn't get over emotional like some coaches do in, in a game situation. And, uh, you know, the players kind of follow that. So that's part of the reason why you see them be able to come back. They don't get over emotional when they're down by three runs. They're getting no hit by USC. They say, let's get to the bullpen. Their bullpen's tired. And that was the case. USC had two really good relievers. But those guys, it was their fifth appearance in 10 days. So they were tired, and and Arizona was able to take advantage once they got Kate Naoki out of the game, able to get a couple runs on it to tie it, and then win it in the ninth inning. So they, and they play to the, the style of their head coach. They follow that style where they stay pretty even kill. They're kind of crazy in the dugout with the bananas and everything else. But overall, the energy stays pretty even. And then they're able to rise up to the occasion in those late in situations. And uh, that's the kind of team you definitely want. And it, I think it just follows along with their head coach. All right. That was an education. If I've ever heard one, I almost want to put my <laughs> pen down now. I mean, I learned so much about college baseball that we weren't just going to get by, you know, reading casual, you know, columns here. I mean, you really broke it down. So really appreciate that. I want to ask you one last thing though. That's kind of separate from college baseball. You cover the PAC 12 and, and USC specifically. Um, what does it, mean to you that the conference is now gone what are you going to miss most about it yeah so i you know this is kind of my adopted conference i grew up in sec land i grew up rooting for georgia teams growing up um you know and i went to school at usc for grad school and started following the pac-12 and have covered the conference for 15 years now and so it is you know as i was leaving the conference and it kind of sunk in when i got on the plane to fly back east uh for this this weekend it's like, wow, it's over. That's it. That is the last Pac-12 competition. And it isn't a coincidence to me that Bill Walton passed away the day after. Um, you know, I think as much as you don't want to say it, it's, it's almost like he was heartbroken by what happened here. And I know he died of cancer. We all, and we all had the same thought. But, yeah. you know, you feel like that's it. He This was the biggest the biggest person, the biggest advocate for the Conference of Champions. And to see it fall apart is it, disappointing. And every coach – at the Pac-12 tournament said pretty much the same thing. It's important. Hey, they're they're excited about the future and they're looking forward to some things. Some of the coaches are not looking forward to other things, including the travel and some of the teams and the makeup. And a lot of the coaches that grew up, whether it be Mitch Canham playing at Oregon State, whether it be Chip Hale, whether it be someone like John Savage or Andy Stankwitz that grew up in you know Southern California and Nevada, those two guys that are on the West Coast, they've seen the Pac-12 at its finest, especially in college baseball. That is is a giant disappointment. Um, it was it was heartbreaking seeing all the the Pac-12 people for the last time because you've gotten to know those people over all the events that you covered, whether it be the Pac-12 tournament, whether it be the championship games, all those type of things. So it's just it is it's a heartbreaking situation to see that, but it all comes back to the incompetence of the leadership uh, from Larry Scott. I mean, how different would the world be in college sports if they did actually accept? Texas and Oklahoma and that situation became the pack at that point. Um, you know, how different would it be? Who knows? But to say, ah, we don't need them and to see how things have unfolded and the Pac-12 has consistently been the ones getting the shaft going forward, it's it's just disappointment. That all stems from the leadership. And, uh, you know, when you don't have good leadership, it, it's not going to be good for business. And now the, the Pac-12 is no longer what we know it has in the past. I'm sure it, they're continuing it. They were pretty adamant about saying the Pac-12, you can't say, I think on the broadcast, they told them that you can't say the Pac-12 is over. It's going to be a different iteration of the Pac-12. Yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. The Pac-12 is over. Um, and it's going to be disappointing. But I will say there is one glimmer of, of, of uh, one sliver 
of hope, not hope, I don't know what it is. It could be something really interesting at least. It's going to be regionals in the future because there is a, you know, there's a stipulation. You can't have two teams from the same conference in a regional. But what's going to happen when Arizona hosts next year and they're welcoming USC and Stanford? They're welcoming a Big Ten team and an ACC team mm. to come out along with GCU or whatever it may be. So mm. what are we going to see in those type of situations? Um, I, I think we're going to end up seeing yeah. some matchups like that. And you're going to be like, oh, an old Pac-12 uh, regional here or something like that. It's going to be – that'll be something interesting to, go, to see going forward because, of course, they're going to stack all the West Coast teams together. Because they always do that. There's always an all West Coast regional. This year it's in uh, Santa Barbara, uh, and they're trying to get some of those West Coast teams out of here. We want to get them out so we get more SEC teams. Put those SEC teams in, right? So uh, we'll see uh, how this stacks up in the future. But that's something that to, to maybe look forward to. It, it'll be a little bit of an anomaly, um, but trying to find some positive out of it. But no, it's it's very disappointing to see the Pac-12 uh, come to a close like it did. Shotgun, that was fantastic. Thank you for uh, informing us once again for the second straight year. And hey, if Arizona makes it to Omaha, I have a feeling we're going to be reaching out saying, hey, tell us who, what they're doing. But one step at a time. Thank you so much for uh, for talking to Shane and I. Thank you very much for having me. I'm actually heading to Charlottesville this week. It's the closest one for driving for me. But like I said, LSU ends up out in Tucson next week. I don't know how I'm going to you know, uh, get the bosses to stop me from heading out for that one. Discover more play for all at Harrah's Ok Chin Casino. Hi, folks. Here are your drinks. Where having fun means racking up reward credits with the Caesars Rewards Loyalty Program. They can be redeemed for food, free play, <laughs> hotel stays, and more. Not only here in the city of Maricopa, but also at more than 50 Caesars properties coast to coast. From Harrah's Las Vegas to Caesars Palace in Atlantic City. What are you waiting for? Play for all at Harrah's Ok Chin Casino, the official sponsor of play. Great stuff from Shotgun there. Boy, he Ooh. was, um, yeah, Love that, it. yeah. It was like, you know, we say Matt Moreno is a professor. He's got think, competition. Yeah, yeah, maybe that was a senior professor of college baseball because, yeah. wow, that was something. Uh, so great info from him. You and I have been doing this uh, in the last segment, our favorite sports memories from a certain year. And the year that was chosen is 2010-2011. Shane, I'll let you start with your first if you have multiple. Well, yeah, I'll, the first thing is a uh, kind of quick backstory to this one. Um uh, the Arizona Washington game, the wide out in Tucson with Derek Williams mm -hmm. block. I was there for that one. Yeah, I, I was, I was too. Yeah. Well, and yeah. the funny thing, uh, you know, Greg Byrne, I don't know if you remember, he used to do some competitions on, on Twitter as far as, uh, you know, get us like retweet this and you'll be entered to win a uh, chance to get some tickets. But that was such a big game. It was a nationally televised game that he said, get me like 10 new followers. The first person mm -hmm. gave me 10 new followers. And I had several of my family members create Twitter accounts that day and follow Greg huh. Byrne. Uh, so we could go to the game. And so, uh, we got, got, he's emailed us tickets, took my nephew, Zach, who you, who we hung out with, uh, at the, uh, for the watch the Alamo bowl. Uh, yep. we're there a little late because there was some sort of accident on the 10. We got there middle of the first half, amazing atmosphere, incredible game. One of the things I remember in addition with it being a great game and Derek Williams block at the end was, uh, it was, I think it was the last time I saw in person, the, the Ua man. Uh, oh, rev, yeah, it's rev up, one, yeah. rev up the crowd, um, you know, and, and like, you know, spelling out Arizona and, and pointing to all the different sections. And for those who are newer to Arizona athletics, uh, ask, ask someone who's a little bit older about the UA man and, and just energy he brought to those games. So that was a great memory. And then the other one, I'll, I'll just mention the one other, and it's an obvious one, but the Duke game in the, the sweet 16, uh, beating them soundly, um, Derek Williams dunk in the second half, Jamel Horn dunking over Kyle Singler. Oh, it's I watched that with Amazing. a couple of buddies at home and yep. I just, I just, I never thought Arizona was going to win that game until like five minutes left. And Arizona was up by 15 points. And I thought, Holy crap, Arizona's actually going to beat Duke and go to the elite eight. It was a great feeling. And it was kind of like a, a catharsis for Arizona fans after, you know, feeling robbed against Duke uh, a decade earlier in the national championship game. So uh, a bit of a cliche. Uh, I know you have one other thought that I would mention that I'm, I'm going to guess you're going to mention it. So I'll let you do it, but those are the two I'm going to mention for now. All right. I, I was the, the Washington game was fun. Uh, I was looking at my old Facebook and I have a picture of the whiteout and saying, oh, how cool this is. You know, we normally we weren't used to whiteouts. And if you remember the other the, the next whiteout that was memorable was uh, 2014, the Austin Hill, the Hill Mary was a oh, whiteout yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so well, I'm sure we'll, we'll cover that one uh, as well. But um, the one that I remember, I believe, September 18th, 2010, 
Arizona 34, Iowa 27. I'm not sure I have ever heard it that uh, Arizona Stadium that loud. Yeah. Um, they sacked Ricky Stanzi uh, on three consecutive plays. It was, sort of, it, was so, it was sort of like four four plays in a row, but yeah. one of them was whistled dead to a false start. But no one heard the whistle because it was so loud in Arizona Stadium. You know, for people that may be new Arizona fans, like you got to go back and watch that sequence on YouTube because it was so electric. I mean, that was those were the days where I would actually yell at games. I, I can't do that anymore. I wouldn't have a voice for three days. But our buddy Rick Elmore had one of the sacks. Brooks Reed, yep. uh, Justin Washington, I think, got in there. He it did. was un and it was on ESPN. And yep. Iowa just never fares well when they cross the Mississippi and go west. And that was an example. It was just phenomenal um, and just a, a really cool atmosphere. Do you remember who caught the game-winning touchdown for Arizona that game? Um, guy had a great, gonna... great nickname. Bug Wright. Bug Wright. Not to be confused with uh, with Scooby Wright. Bug Wright. Well, you 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 uh, you know you you spoiled that one with the great nickname part. But that that game was one of. If you were to ask me, like the loudest that I can remember, Arizona Stadium, I would probably put the Oregon game in 09. That game in 2010 uh, would definitely be up there. Maybe the ASU game in 2014, the one that were you know both teams were right around the top 10. Yeah. Um, those would be ones that would come to mind. Um, I'm not sure that we've had one that crazy since, but I'll tell you that this year's got, you know, UCLA and Utah got pretty fun. Yeah. Well, and the last thing I'll mention is uh, 2010. So September 25th, 2010, uh, Arizona played Cal and he scored a last minute touchdown to win that game 10 to nine. I think that was Nick Foles to Jerron Kreiner in the last minute drive. I wasn't there. I actually got had season tickets that year, but I split them with a buddy of mine. I wasn't able to go on September 25th because I was getting married that day. Huh, so during married. during the wedding reception, I'm looking at my flip phone because, you know, 2010 and looking at the score and I keep looking and Arizona's losing. And I'm like, well, you I'm know, sure Jenny I, was thrilled. Yeah. Well, she didn't care. We were all, I, I snuck in him while we were doing a bunch of other stuff. OK, um, okay. yeah, it, there was a lot of going on. No one. No one cared. Um, so but I looked at like Arizona's losing. And I'm like, well, I'm just as well I missed that game. And then I look at the end and, you know, an hour later and they won 10 to nine. So I missed that one for, I guess, a good reason. Um, but, you know, Nick Foles had three fantastic last minute drives that year against Iowa, against Cal. And then the last one we don't talk about, which was against ASU because of all everything that happened after that, that we don't have to get into because we're talking about our favorite moments. Um, but Nick Foles had a phenomenal year and I, I was at the Iowa game. It was great. And um, there were a lot of good memories from from 2010 and 11, both uh, on the football and basketball front, even though the the football season definitely uh, didn't end the way we wanted. Uh, yeah. And I mean, you you hit on the other two that I was going to say with, with basketball. And I think, you know, we hit on just just being there. And, you know, I think every Arizona fan probably remembers where they were watching that Duke game. Oh, that yeah. was an un, unbelievable. I, I don't think any of us will forget who were, who we were with or just watching that game that that was one of the most memorable arizona basketball games uh, of our lifetime so certainly good to uh to think about uh we will reminisce about another year in the 2000s next year or next week there you but go. uh thanks to shotgun spratling for joining us uh thanks to harris auction casino to ice shaker to my partner shane dale i'm eric cohen uh once again thanks for watching and as always bear down <laughs>